Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terry McDinos, the president and CEO of RTCA. Greetings from our nation's capital and welcome to all of you. It is now our 15th in a series of webinars, Aviation Technology Connect. We are pleased to have created this series via this platform to hear from a variety of aviation industry leaders on a broad spectrum of topics, which we hope will educate you, uh, further inspire you in your profession, and perhaps even evolve your thinking as to where the industry is today and, and where it's going in the future. Over the past year and a half, our webinar series has been highly successful, exceeding all of our expectations here at RTCA. We've uh, attracted an international audience each month, not only from here in the United States, uh, but also from Canada, countries across Europe, the Middle East, Africa, South America, Australia, and New Zealand. And we believe that today's webinar will be equally exciting and informative. Now, these uh, previous webinars were recorded, as is this one. So if you want to go back and listen to any of our previous webinars, uh, you can find those recordings on the RTCA YouTube channel. Now, I know many of you watching today are familiar with RTCA, but if you'd like to learn more about RTCA, our, our standards development work, the various educational courses we have available, or if you are interested in becoming part of the RTCA family of members, uh, you can go to our website at www.rtca.org for further information. Now, we're not going to have any time for audience questions today because we have a lot of material to go over. Uh, but if you do have any questions for the RTCA staff during the webinar, uh, feel free to use your Q&A tab on the webinar platform to communicate with us. So let's get started, and I'm incredibly pleased to have with us today to kick off our 2022 series of webinars, someone who really needs no introduction, a distinguished graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, a 30-year career as a pilot for Delta Airlines, and now the administrator for the Federal Aviation Administration, the Honorable Steve Dixon. Captain Dixon, welcome to RTCA, and thank you for kicking off our 2022 series of webinars. Thanks, Terry. I'm a big fan of RTCA and all the work that uh, that you do, and uh, thank you for your leadership. And I'm looking out over a beautiful day here at 800 Independence and really enjoying this uh, warm fire that we've got for our fireside chat. I hope your room is warmer than ours because it's very chilly over here in our offices. <laughs> Um, well, before we get into our fireside chat, I'd like to first just turn things over to you for a few introductory comments, uh, perhaps some reflections as you look, back, look, um, look back on the past year, and uh, what you see as some of the primary focus areas and challenges for your agenda in 2022. Well, thanks, Terry. And again, uh, great to be here. Um, you know, 2021 was obviously uh, a very challenging year, but it also was filled with uh, a lot of opportunities. And I think 2022, uh, tremendous opportunities, uh, you know, hopefully as we come out of the pandemic here, but just uh, a lot of innovation, a really exciting time uh, in, in aviation. Uh, you know, our leadership team, we're very fortunate, very blessed. Uh, Deputy Administrator Brad Mims uh, has been on board for a little over a year now. And, uh, you know, among Brad's many talents, uh, you know, he is really focused on our workforce, uh, the development of our people, and also future opportunities for uh, young people coming into aviation and aerospace. And of course, uh, you know, to that end, diversity, equity, uh, inclusion, and accessibility is a, is a big part of that. You know, the last thing we can afford in a, in a safety organization or in a safety business as group think. And so a diversity of experience and perspectives is extremely valuable. Um, we also have a, a brand new associate administrator for aviation safety. So AVS-1, who essentially in the United States, I think as everyone knows, is, is the equivalent of the director general for uh, civil aviation and other countries around the world. And uh, so Captain Billy Nolan, uh, we are very fortunate to have Billy on board. He has jumped uh, literally into the deep end of the pool here in his first couple of weeks. Uh, we've also got a brand new uh, chief counsel, Mark Nichols. And uh, so, you know, those two leaders are going to be very instrumental in driving a lot of positive change in uh, 2022 uh, and beyond. Uh, as I mentioned, we saw, you know, we're seeing a lot of innovation right now. And, uh, 
We're seeing a lot of commercial space activity, uh, setting records just about every week. Uh, advanced air mobility is becoming a, a real thing. And uh, even as we continue to operate the safest and most dynamic and diverse um, aviation system uh, in the world under some very trying conditions. I mean, I'm extremely proud of how our air traffic controllers, our technicians, uh, everyone has continued uh, to keep the system open and operating under some very challenging circumstances. And we've gotten uh, very good at it and have proven to ourselves just how resilient um, we can be. Uh, on the back on the innovation side, you know, we're seeing uh, this past year, we saw uh, commercial human space flight. You know, we even had Captain Kirk getting beamed up, right? I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, we also watched uh, Alan Shepard's daughter and uh, Michael Strahan go up to space on the same mission. Uh, and, and of course, many others uh, as well. And the pace of launches has been uh, just as stellar. I think we had something on the order of uh, 60 uh, FAA licensed uh, launches and reentries last year. And of course, when you're sending humans into space, you have to have a reentry, right? You know, <laughs> you want to make sure that your uh, number of uh, landings equals your number of takeoffs. So, uh, but year over year, commercial space continues to shatter records. And, uh, and I'm very proud of the agency's success uh, in ensuring uh, public safety throughout all of that commercial uh, space activity. Um, so we've got Captain Kirk, but we've also got the Jetsons. You know, that gets back to uh, advanced air mobility. Um, we saw a lot of, a lot of progress uh, in this sector, got a number of vehicles, a number of companies that we're working with. And, uh, you know, these game-changing uh, uh, electric uh, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft could be poised to begin transporting passengers and cargo uh, in our cities and regional airports as soon as 2024. And in our business, I mean, that's literally right in front of us. So, uh, you know, we're, our team's working very hard to enable those kinds of operations. For example, we're working on uh, interim and future vertiport guidance. Um, using data and information that's currently available from the advanced air mobility vehicle uh, manufacturers. Now, of course, in terms of challenges, you know, we're still dealing with COVID, as we all know. And, uh, and now, of course, the Omicron variant, uh, you know, remains to be seen whether we're starting to hit a, a peak of that and what's on the other side. But as it, uh, as, as it continues, you know, we need to maintain, uh, we need to stay disciplined on safety and do everything we can uh, to ensure consistency and predictability throughout the aviation system. Uh, I think as everyone knows, you know, over the past year, we had seen a dramatic uptick in unruly passenger incidents. And uh, we've undertaken a number of measures uh, to get that under control. And I'm happy to say that the rates are down significantly uh, year over year, but we still got more work to do. And, uh, and this is, uh, again, something that we need to continue to stay focused on. But uh, again, I think that the agency has been uh, quite resilient and responsive uh, in uh, continuing our safety and operational mission. And I'm really proud of the 45,000 uh, strong uh, group of FAA people that work at the agency. Now for the coming year, um, we wanna continue to deliver um, improving margins of safety. We never will rest we're never satisfied uh, with our safety performance. So we always need to be looking at the, uh, the next opportunities to raise the, uh, the safety bar and also become uh, more efficient as well, even as we deal with the, uh, the changes and sometimes the disruptions to the system. Um, we want to embrace the opportunities, again, as I talked about before, orbital and suborbital space tourism, uh, automation, uh, drones, advanced air mobility, while at the same time managing the uh, ever-changing challenges uh, of threats like cyber attacks, uh, dealing with climate change, making sure that we've got a sustainable aviation system, and of course, uh, global public health emergencies like uh, COVID-19. We have to plan as if uh, there's always gonna be some sort of disruptor. And if you look at the national airspace system, there is some sort of 
constraint or disruption that we're dealing with every single day, whether it's a, you know, runway construction or weather or whatever the case may be, there are always going to be challenges that we have to manage around. And, and we're very good at that, very good at being resilient, and, and we're always improving. Um, we've also got to continue industry collaboration. We want to be transparent. Uh, we want to be, you know, not all wisdom emanates from 800 uh, Independence Avenue. I'll be the first one to say that. So it's really important that we are uh, getting out into the community, getting outside the Beltway, um, you know, talking with our, our stakeholders and really understanding uh, the opportunities and the challenges uh, that they're dealing with so that we can be a more um, effective uh, safety regulator, but also uh, more effective and efficient in uh, operating the national airspace system. Um, now, our strategic plan, uh, Flight Plan 21, which we've been operating under for the last couple of years, has four key pillars to it. Um, safety, of course, always has to be at the top of the list. People, global leadership, and operational excellence, as you would expect. And it provides a roadmap uh, on our activities and aligns our resources to make sure that we are always tracking uh, towards uh, making improvements in all of those areas. Through the safety pillar, we establish a strong safety culture throughout the agency. Uh, and again, I think we have really reinvigorated our safety culture the past couple of years. We take advantage of data. Uh, we really want to look at data from an enterprise perspective, not just within individual stovepipes. We want to take things like FOQA data and, uh, you know, external air traffic systems, uh, streaming data off of aircraft, and integrate all of that so that we can create predictive models to become even uh, more accurate about identifying and mitigating emerging uh, safety risks. That's how we're going to. You know, we already are very fortunate that we have the safest aviation system in the world. And to get that next uh, incremental improvement, uh, we've got to get even more creative and, and look at things from a, a holistic uh, level. Under operational excellence, uh, we're going to improve our service delivery. Um, of course, we're using performance reporting to help us stay ahead of potential operational problems. We collaborate uh, with the industry multiple times a day on this and we have a daily uh, planning uh, webinar with the industry. So there's no surprises in terms of areas uh, dealing with those constraints uh, that I talked about before. Um, we also want to continue to be a leader in addressing the environmental impacts of aviation, including of course, climate change uh, and noise and improving sustainability and resilience of our own FAA facilities um, and assets. Now for global leadership, uh, the United States, the FAA in particular, uh, has a, a very important leadership role to play uh, around the world. We have a, there's a lot that we can offer to help our international partners build the best safety organizations possible. And, uh, and of course, under our people pillar, uh, a lot uh, wrapped up in that, enriching our, enriching our talent pool, uh, placing a stronger emphasis on employee development, uh, leadership development diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, as I talked about before. And then, of course, innovation and cybersecurity kind of run across uh, really the entire, uh, the entire spectrum, if you will. Uh, we've seen how a proliferation of cyber attacks have caused sensitive information to fall to the hands of foreign actors on occasion. And every one of our strategic initiatives considers how we will strengthen the agency's overall approach to cybersecurity to prevent any future incidents. So again, this, all of this relates back to the core mission of the FAA, which is to operate the safest and most efficient aerospace system in the world. And it's my sincere hope that uh, this plan that, that, uh, that we've laid out and that we're executing on will help us to write the next great chapter uh, in the FAA story. So uh, that's all I had for an opener here, uh, yeah. Terry, but I'm happy to get into, uh, into your questions. Yeah, great, that, that's a great overview of uh, uh, some of the topics I'd like to cover with you this afternoon. And um, just to kind of start on the, the, the safety piece of things, as I know that's a very important part of both the agency, and I know it's a personal passion of, of yours as well. 
and we're certainly very familiar with the excellent safety record of the uh, commercial airline industry and how that all came about. Um, and I know there's some other efforts going on to help bring the general, avi general aviation sector up to those levels. And that's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart, having a son who's working his way up through the ranks right now, is working in the, the GA community to you know, build up his flight time and experience. So what's some of the key safety messages that the FAA would like to get out to the general aviation community you know, to help them achieve a lower accident rate? Well, Jerry, you know, I mean, you and I both have an air carrier background and, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, there are some, some constructs that we have used very successfully in uh, commercial aviation that can be applied to uh, general aviation. A commercial aviation safety uh, team, for example. Uh, now it gets a little bit more difficult with the general aviation community because uh, just because of the diversity and the size and, and really just the, the variability that you have in the capability of, of different operators. Um, but we, we, there's not really a need to reinvent the wheel. What we've got to do is adapt what's really worked well you know, to that sector. And that's what we've been doing uh, for the last several years. And I'll be the first one to say that I'm excited about uh, the, the continued opportunities um, there in the coming years. So, you know, we work very closely with uh, the safety advocates in the GA sector. Um, we're following uh, the CAST model, if you will, uh, the equivalent within general aviation. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee or GAJSC. So it doesn't quite roll off the tongue um, as well, but anybody um, in the safety circles within general aviation uh, really understands what that's all about and how it's really created a good platform for uh, collaborating. Um, within that government industry group, uh, we combine the expertise of key decision makers from different parts of the agency. Uh, we can leverage some of the resources that we have in terms of data visualization, for example, that we use in the, uh, with, with CAST. Um, we can apply a lot of that same uh, analytical heft, if you will, to the, um, to, uh, the general aviation sector. Uh, we also have several GA associations to review uh, accent trends, uh, identify areas for detailed studies, and to share information. Um, to date, the GAJSC has tackled accents, including things like uh, the highest risk areas, like in-flight loss of control, um, engine failures, sea fit, controlled flight into terrain. Um, they're also uh, currently working on failures that are unrelated to uh, engine failures as well, other component failures. So uh, as a result of this, what's happened is we have uh, been able to get everybody around the table and we have pulled in uh, the GA sector to get them more involved in data monitoring and analysis. I mean, every group that I talk to talking about the importance of, uh, of flight data monitoring. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have, you know, a great focal system. There are things that we that can be scaled in terms of monitoring our performance um, that, are, that are actually very affordable. They'll give us some great insight into our operations. Um, and of course, a growing number of operators are taking part in ASIAS, the Aviation Safety Information Analysis and Sharing Program. So uh, we've actually got 146 corporate and business members, um, as well as 14 universities and flight schools participating in ASIAS. That wasn't the case a few years ago. So it's a much broader uh, outreach and, uh, and involvement and engagement. And I think that's very beneficial um, as all. And then uh, finally, I wanna thank everyone who's involved with RTCA Special Committee 231. Uh, that greatly supported the mitigations that were developed uh, under the, uh, uh, the steering committee's CFIT working group. That was uh, extremely important and extremely beneficial uh, to all of us, I think. Great. Well, thanks. Um, so you, you brought up technology in, in your opening, and I know technology um, uh, has, is a big interest to many of our TCA's members and, and probably to many of the folks in the audience. So as we start looking at all these technological advancements that are moving very quickly and, and you know, developing new applications, new tools, uh, new platforms, 
you know, given that expectation of safety by both the traditional operators as well as the traveling public, um, how do you balance that push and pull between safety and innovation in a very you know, safety critical environment? Well, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, we all, we want to foster innovation, but we've got to uh, find ways to, to uh, nurture that innovation and do it in a safe manner. Um, now, the easiest thing probably is to never turn a wheel. That's not acceptable either. Uh, so, you know, again, we want to uh, be methodical, but we also want to support uh, new entrants uh, as, as they come in. And one of the challenges I think the agency has, if you look at legacy aviation, uh, you know, the FAA wears several different hats there. You know, we regulate the manufacturers, we regulate the operators, uh, and we run the air traffic control system, and then we have commercial space. We have all these different sectors. A lot of these uh, new innovative uh, companies um, design and build and operate their own machines. You know, you don't see that in commercial aviation for sure. And so the agency is not really organized or has not historically been organized in a way that we can work across from an enterprise level. And so that's a, that's a big focus uh, that we have. And that's one reason why data is, is so important. The last thing I want to have happen is uh, someone come to the agency and they go to, you know, door number one and their, their problem is solved. And then they find out, you know, that they can't use what they've got certified or whatever, because they haven't talked to another part of the agency. So we've got to work more effectively across uh, the agency. And that's what our innovation uh you know, uh, is really all about. And that's, that's because these new, um, uh, new entrants, newer entrants um, have a different kind of a little different business model uh, than traditional aviation companies. Um, so, uh, but the public's expectations for safety, you know, we can't compromise those. So we've got to do the same thing. For example, with commercial space, you know, with the with the increase in launches, we can't afford every time there's a launch out of uh, off the space coast in Florida, we can't shut airspace down like we did, you know, 20 years ago. Right. And so we've really got to work with the operators to be much more surgical and much more dynamic about things like that. And that way, we we are in we are ensuring that we uh, maintain the safety of the airspace outside of that, that launch trajectory and we protect the public, but we do it in a way that doesn't shut down, you know, New York to Miami for four hours, right? Okay. Uh, and the other thing that we need to do is really use the right tool in our toolbox. Um, I'm a big fan and, and the agency over the last, you know, 15, 20 years has moved more to performance-based regulation. And, uh, so setting a baseline of standards is important, but there, a lot of times there are, there are multiple ways uh, to get to a safe and compliant outcome. And so we want to make sure that our performance-based rules and regulations um, are developed with a, a heavy dose of collaboration uh, with the aviation and aerospace community. Good. So um, something's been in the news a lot involving the use of frequencies and spectrum issues. And I don't want to get into all, all the, the latest goings on, but certainly the impact on, on that use of frequency spectrum and, and the impact that it's having on aviation is, is have its challenges. And I think it's probably going to have its challenges for many years. Um, but at the same time, going forward, the, some of these new technology applications in aviation, as well as from non-aviation users, are going to need that further access to these spectrum frequencies. So, so from your perspective, you know what what should the industry be doing? Whether it's the aviation industry or other uh, parts uh, or other non-aviation industries, and what can the FAA do to ensure that we have a good, smooth integration and, and coexistence of the you know these various and sometimes competing interests for spectrum? Well, you know, as you said, there has been a, a quite a bit in the news about this recently, and. And my, uh, we've got to have a safe aviation system. 
uh, but at the same time, we have, uh, in this case, two very different industries that have different ways of looking at risk. And, uh, and I think over the last you know, couple of months, we understand each other much better than, than we did before. We're working very effectively together uh, because we want to enable 5G C-band deployment, make no mistake about that but we've got to do it in a way so that aviation safety is not compromised. And there's a way to do that. It just requires uh, engagement and, uh, and collaboration. And I'm optimistic that we will be able to achieve that. I think going forward, um, you know, we, we will all, you know, we'll be guided by safety, but we also want to understand the data in this case from the telecom industry so that we can apply it to the aviation safety construct and understand how we can work together to both create opportunities for them, but also make sure that the safety of the traveling public is achieved um, at the same time. Uh, the U.S. is not like other countries in the world. Uh, there, you know, we have a much more dynamic, much more uh, diverse. We are an aviation nation, and uh, so you know, we we really rely. Aviation is something like 7% of our economy. So we want to make sure that aviation and 5G can, uh, can safely coexist. And, and I think we'll be able to do that by working together. Um, I'm very optimistic. So the bottom line is we need to build stronger, uh, more systemic and predictable ways to collaborate together. Uh, keep in mind, you know, the, the, uh, the telecommunications companies, we're not their regulator. And they're not necessarily used to, you know, in aviation, airlines and manufacturers, they have to share in their information with the FAA. Okay. And so, and we're making, we're making decisions on risk based on, you know, being very tightly integrated in, in what we're looking at. Uh, so it's taken some time to get everybody comfortable with that. But again, we've made a lot of progress in a very short period of time. And I think with, uh, with the folks we've got at the table um, and frankly, the secretary's leadership, um, you know, we have, we've been able to, uh, to make a lot of progress here. And I'm confident that we'll be able to, uh, to do this in a way that, that uh, will be uh, uh, a much smoother path um, going forward. I mean, it's really similar to technology in general. I mean, that that early and often collaboration between industry and government are so important for success. And the earlier you can do it, the more robust that those conversations are, I think probably Absolutely. will help, help to get us there, exactly. Um, so now kind of the other side of technology, I'm thinking about older technologies that are out there. Um, you know, what, what kind of method do you think the industry should start thinking about um, in terms of the use of some of those recognized technologies that were once very widespread um, and they were very necessarily, but maybe they fulfilled their purpose and should be retired. So I'm thinking of um, VOR systems, don't really wanna think about ADF, NDB approaches, um, but you know, passive surveillance, primary radar, for example, or, or even voice communications. I mean, what are, you know, what are things that we should be thinking about there? Yeah, well, certainly, uh, you know, there uh, the the infrastructure and the processes and the technologies that we uh, rely upon uh, have changed a, a lot, and there are a lot of new opportunities. ADSB is a good, you know, recent example, and I remember all the drama around the the January 2020 ADSB mandate. That seems like a whole <laughs> lifetime ago now. That's right. To think about everything we've been through in the last couple of years. So, uh, you know, I think the, the point I would start with is we don't make these changes in a vacuum. You know, we're not good, just going to shut down, uh, you know, legacy systems or older systems without making sure that the entire community, all, all the stakeholders understand uh, the reasons why and, and what that, you know, what the pathway uh, is, if that makes sense. Um, our long range plans are spelled out in a number of uh, publications. Um, we've got the, uh, our capital investment plan, the uh, CIP for the FAA, the National Aerospace System Enterprise Architecture uh, Infrastructure Roadmaps, 
uh, the FA strategic plan and our, our PBN strategy, performance-based navigation. So you mentioned radars. Um, obviously, to some degree for normal ATC surveillance, you know, ADSB data link has, you know, replaced radars, but we still need radars. We need them for resiliency. Uh, we have areas where we don't have ADSB coverage and, and we have operators that, that, uh, that may not need uh, ADSB for the air, you know, for the airspace that they're, uh, if they're not flying in rural airspace. So, uh, you know, the evolution of radar is really tightly coupled uh, to uh, the emergence of the emergence of uh, ADSB, but um, but and although ADSB is the preferred method of surveillance, um, radar is still going to have a pretty significant role to play. Um, we use uh, data fusion to bring forward uh, the the highest fidelity surveillance picture uh, for the airspace. So that starts with ADSB in most cases but we'll synthesize uh, radar data in there as well. Um, so that's, that's, that's an efficient way to do it. We are currently assessing um, whether we can remove about 14% of the short range cooperative and non-cooperative radars in the NAS. Uh, so that's ongoing work. Um, but again, they will continue to be an integral part uh, of, the, of our surveillance um, infrastructure uh, again, we've got to continue to monitor airspace where we don't have ADSB. Um, we've got to be able to uh, detect uh, non-equipped airplanes, and uh, and then of course we want that we want that comp that complement and that resiliency that I talked about um, on VOR and voice communications. Um, you know, we've I don't know how long this term's been out there, but VOR mon. I mean, that's I think that goes back to when. Mm -hmm. You and I were still, <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, but uh, we utilized RTCA to uh, to share and gather information that we used to develop a program to right size our VOR network. Uh, we regularly update uh, and communicate the status of that program to the public uh, through multiple channels. Uh, Federal Register being uh, one of the most significant, um, and presentations at a variety of aviation events. And, and forums that we're all in. For voice, um, you know, we're collaborating with industry there as well. Um, uh, RFIs, um, and, you know, we are in the process of migrating from an, an, uh, an analog environment to, uh, you know, VOIP. And uh, so that work, you know, will continue in the coming years. And of course, we've got the whole data comm effort uh, going on as well. I don't, you know, we're a ways away from completely replacing voice communications. You'll always want to have that, that capability, I think, as a backup. But, um, but certainly as the Datacom program rolls out, you know, there will be a, a look at uh, probably sunsetting uh, some uh, voice communication capabilities out there. Great. I'd like to pivot now um, you, to kind of an integration issue. You talked about everything from, from the Jetsons to Captain Kirk utilizing the airspace today. And as we, we continue to see various industries um, enter into the airspace and share it with each other, um, not only with the new entrants, but also with the traditional operators, um, what are your views on you know, some of the approaches that we have to take to integrate everyone into the system? Well, we actually have an advantage in the U.S. Uh, because we have one national airspace system. We have one air navigation service provider, the air traffic organization, and we have the safety regulator that's all under the same roof. So there's some synergy there. Uh, now we do have challenges. We've got certain sectors. I mean, we were talking about general aviation. We've got the most vibrant general aviation uh, sector uh, in the world. Got quite a bit of mil military activity compared to a lot of parts of the world. So, uh, you know, we, we will introduce and we are introducing new entrants um, uh, in a timely way, but not before it's time. And we're using things like uh, pilot programs uh, to, if we don't have the construct to scale operations around the entire national airspace system, we can uh, approach it in the early going 
through waivers or specific applications where we can uh, we can prove concepts and while we're enabling um, some operations. And you know, as as you know, uh, we're working very hard. We just uh, wrapped up the uh, Beyond Visual Line of Sight arc uh, for drones, and uh, looking forward to using that work product to inform the rulemaking around uh, Beyond Visual Line of Sight operations around the NAS. That'll be really exciting when we get to that point. We got remote identification across the, the line uh, this past year. And so this builds you know, towards the next step of, of, uh, of normalizing uh, drone operations. Um, we're probably gonna see, I talked about advanced air mobility. Uh, there's some areas, uh, and AAM is a good example. We don't really need to invent things because there's a lot of the, a lot of what is uh, a lot of it's already there, right? Because we have to, we have heliports. Uh, you know, we have helicopter operations. Um, now, the AAM may use different infrastructure and all that, but but the basic concepts uh, will work certainly in the early going with that sector. And then as we learn about things that we need, because these are electric vehicles, for example, or maybe it's an airplane instead of a rotorcraft, you know, we'll certainly apply all of that, um, you know, as we go forward. So we want to make sure that we uh, integrate the new entrance in a safe and timely uh, fashion. Um, and again, we do that through multiple ways. Um, and I'm excited about the opportunities that we're going to have here um, in the next couple of years, for sure. So I, I know certification reform has been on your, your radar scope, so to speak, for probably ever since you got to the agency. Um, so what priorities does the FAA have right now in 2022 to address any further reforms in the certification process? Well, I think the, the, the good news about certification reform is that it, it is proceeding at an extremely rapid pace. Um, we had the benefit of you know, we opened up our processes to uh, regulators around the world very early on through the Joint Authorities Technical Review. And, and then we had several other reviews that really informed the process improvements that we needed to put in place. And uh, in December of 2020, of course, we, uh, we had the uh, Aircraft Certification Reform Act. And it actually encompassed a lot of the recommendations that we already had in hand and that we already had in work. So that was really a, really a great thing. And um, we are moving out um, very quickly. Um, I've got a, a, a project team that updates me um, and our uh, oversight committees uh, in Congress on a regular basis. And we're implementing more than a hundred requirements in the bill but they fall along certain lines of effort, you know, about 10 lines of effort in there. And, uh, and the things that we wanted to focus on, for example, um, internationally harmonizing the change product rule for mm -hmm. type certificates, you know, those, those types of things. We want to make sure that the U.S. and uh, other certification authorities around the world, that we're all approaching this uh, consistently. And, uh, and so we'll incorporate you know, the lessons that they have learned within their systems as we reform uh, our own. And that's not the only example. I mean, there are several other examples of that kind of work and how important international collaboration is. Of course, you know, we're delegating fewer responsibilities in general uh, to the manufacturers. We have set up uh, a, and actually uh, staffed our uh, ODA office which is providing uh, quality control and consistency across all of our uh, ODAs, uh, all, all of our ODA uh, oversight functions, about 80 of them. And uh, that'll be very beneficial. And, and then we're bringing SMS principles uh, to play. That was one of the first things I noticed uh, even before I got to the agency was that uh, the, the processes that we had put in place with the manufacturers were in my view, lagging behind what we had done with the Part 121 carriers in terms of SMS. And of course, it's a little different business, but the, the principles are the same. Make sure that we've got good voluntary safety reporting. Uh, make sure that 
uh, business decisions don't get in the way of safety, right? And, uh, and so that the safety organization and in the case of a manufacturing, the engineering organization is empowered. It's like, uh, you know, I used to tell the captains at Delta, you know, we all want to be on time, but um, if things don't look right, you know, pull off to the side, set the parking brake and let's get things sorted out. That's right. um, and so it's, it's really the same kind of, of construct. We need to make sure that we do things um, you know, right. We're also, uh, this is where data comes in. We're expanding our portfolio of, of data collection analytic tools. Um, it really is, I, I want to get us to, you know, we're proactive with, with data, but I want us to get to a true predictive model and, uh, you know, be able to use both our certification processes and feed back into them our continued operational safety processes so that we're building, uh, we're actually overseeing better and better designs and through the entire life cycle um, of an airplane. And of course, uh, you know, we'll work with ICAO and, uh, and of course, uh, EASA, Transport Canada, ANAC, other authorities around the world uh, to make sure that we're looking at all these things consistently um, as, uh, as states of design as we go forward. Okay. But what about the, the role of human factors in the design and certification process? How does that fit in? Human factors is um, right at the top of the list. You know, the human is part of the system. And I think as we have seen, uh, you know, the human still to this day, particularly in transport category aircraft, adds a lot of value in terms of flexibility, decision-making, uh, that very hard to automate, at least at scale. Um, and, you know, there's the, the, the best safety system is, uh, you know, two qualified pilots, you know, in the front of the airplane and the judgment that, uh, that a qualified flight crew uh, brings into play. Uh, but as, as systems are designed, we need to make sure that they are not opaque in the way that the automation, the, the way the human interacts or interacts with the machine. Uh, because one of the most dangerous things that can happen is the loss of situational awareness when you're, uh, when you're managing the flight path of the aircraft. And manual flying skills are certainly important. We need to be practicing those, but it really is, how does the, how does the aircraft architecture keep the human engaged in what's actually going on with the airplane in terms of energy state uh, and all the other things, you know, got all this information coming at you and how do we synthesize it in a way so that the human is actually engaged and not kind of on the outside looking in because that's how you uh, lose awareness of, of what's going on with the flight path of the aircraft. So all that has to work together and that's, we've actually doubled the number of of human factors experts within the agency over the past a little bit over a year, and uh, it'll continue to be a huge focus uh, in our um, in our certification efforts, but also in our uh, continued operational safety efforts as well. Um, infrastructure. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, when you think about in infrastructure, you know, there's a lot of always talk about airports, air traffic management facilities. Um, and now we've got a $25 billion investment that comes with the Biden administration's bipartisan uh, infrastructure law. Um, tell us more about those infrastructure law investments and any you know, other priorities the FAA has right now for infrastructure investment. Well, th this, is a, this is a really good news story for the agency and for aviation uh, in general. Uh, $20 billion for airports, but also $5 billion in uh, FAA capital funding, which we call our facilities and equipment budget. We haven't had that kind of, of, uh, of resources to put towards our own infrastructure um, in years. And uh, we've got some uh, aging facilities out there, you know, our, our in route traffic control centers, the route traffic control centers are pretty long in the tooth. And uh, I want to have a great place for our, our people to work, but we, al we also need uh, modern facilities uh, as we continue to make the airspace more and more efficient. So uh, we've got a big uh, tail, 
big sustainment tail you know, on that. And so this will really be uh, welcome uh, to be able to put those kinds of resources into our air traffic infrastructure. And this is, this is a part of the aviation infrastructure that the public doesn't see, right? right? The only thing that you usually see is uh, you might see a tower at an airport, but there's a lot more to it than that, right? We've got our, our uh, high altitude uh, uh, centers. We've got our uh, terminal radar approach and departure controls, um, you know, other air traffic facilities and all of that. We've got, I think something like about 320 or so manned facilities and a bunch of, of unmanned facilities as well. So uh, to be able to put the, the investment in those is, is really important and I'm excited about that. Um, uh, in December, back to airports, um, the department issued, released the first round of airport grants um, and airports can use the, the money for uh, runways, taxiways, safety, and importantly, sustainability projects. Uh, as well as terminal and airport transit connections and roadway roadway projects. So this is this money is is more flexible um, than your traditional uh, airport improvement program grants, which are generally uh, you know safety is always going to be at the top of the list, but uh, they're more limited applicability uh, more on the air side of, of the airport. So the ability to be able to address terminals is is, is really great. Um, and of course, I talked about a uh, billion dollars a year in air traffic is 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 huge. Yeah, yeah. that's going to be great. I know a lot of folks are going are very very excited about that. From 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 the environment perspective, obviously aviation and gets watched very closely, and in all the efforts that we've been making to reduce our environmental impact. Um, how, how do you see some of those those global economically critical services that aviation provides? Can they continue against this backdrop backdrop of, of um, heightened environmental awareness? Well, I think uh, you know obviously aviation is a, is a is a big contributor, and uh, and we have to uh, we have to address the sustainability of the sector for climate. We know that. Um, I think the good news is that the FAA has never wavered uh, from its efforts and we're actually getting uh, more help and visibility into, into the efforts that we've already undertaken through things like the CLEAN program and uh, PAFI and, and others. So uh, it certainly is more pressing. Um, I think that the US is stepping up to take an ever increasing uh, leadership role uh, in the aviation uh, climate sector. Uh, you can see it uh, in the goals and the, the efforts to develop and introduce um, new aircraft with improved environmental performance. I talked about clean. You know, we work, but we're in phase three of clean. This is where we work with the engine manufacturers on more, more efficient and greener um, engine designs. And a lot of the engine designs that are out there now were actually uh, developed because uh, the agency was able to take some of that, some of that uh, R and D risk, uh, able to assume some of that with, uh, with the engine manufacturers over a period of years. Um, I think our biggest near-term um, thing that we need to go after is sustainable aviation fuels. We've got to work on the supply chain, and we've got to scale up production. Uh, and again, this is, this is sort of like 5G in the sense that we've got to work with uh, industries that we don't regulate and we've got to get everybody around the table uh, to, uh, to make sure that the, that the business opportunities are there, but also that we're able to hold hands and produce it in sufficient quantities uh, so that we can have a vibrant aviation sector um, as we go forward. Um, uh, Back to clean for a moment. It stand, actually stands for uh, continuous lower emissions uh, or continuous lower energy emissions and noise. I always forget, I always have to look in, uh, uh, at the acronym, but uh, clean's currently funded at about $20 million a year. Um, and the, uh, the president's FY22 budget, um, as well as the Senate and House markups on the budget would actually double the funding to uh, Roughly forty million a year, so you know that's another that's another opportunity to really improve 
uh, engine technology and uh, get the next generation of, of engines out there as new aircraft types are developed. You, um, you talked about the, the importance of international leadership from the FAA and um, obviously I think that that's a huge thing in helping to promote um, you know, new innovation on a worldwide basis. Um, again, something that's kind of near and dear to RTCA being an international standards development organization. I know that, that industry, industry is very motivated by having harmonized regulations and, and the standards. Um, so how does the work, FAA work with other regulators and ICAO to, to arrive at a common view on consensus standards? No, it's a great question. And I think uh, harmonization can mean different things to different people, right? It doesn't necessarily mean things are exactly the same everywhere because that can introduce, you know, undesirable rigidity or doesn't take, it, uh, take into account uh, you know, differences in the aviation system uh, around the world. Having said that, um, the agency provides very strong support and leadership in developing the ICAO uh, SARPs, the Standards and Recommended Practices, as you know, um, and guidance materials. Uh, I have been leaning forward and very supportive in terms of uh, FA resources uh, that are uh, devoted towards uh, supporting our presence up, up at ICAO, and we'll continue to do that. Um, we have participated in uh, 20 panels that cover 15 out of the 19 annexes to the Chicago Convention and dozens of supporting study and advisory groups that are uh, underway right now. Um, I also, you know, we also send subject matter experts um, as needed on multi year assignments. To ICAO headquarters, I've got several folks, several detailees uh, who work up at ICAO and also in our regional offices. Uh, they support the technical work within the ICAO secretariat. So it's not just a matter of, you know, the U.S. government support, but it's also the FAA is actually there with boots on the ground. Um, we collaborate extensively um, regionally and multilaterally as well. Um, we're working very closely, for example, with Brexit, you know, the UKCA, where we've had for the last couple of years, um, very close dialogue uh, with the UKCA and we're supporting each other on, on a number of topics. Um, we, uh, we work uh, with uh, certain authorities around the world. Uh, we're very close to, uh, to Singapore, uh, Japan. I mentioned Brazil, Brazil, ANAC is uh, one of the states of design obviously the home of, uh, of Embraer. And so that, that is, um, uh, you know, a very important relationship uh, to us as well. Uh, and the, that collaboration in advance of uh, ICAO assemblies and other things really allows us to come in with a, uh, with a unified voice and, uh, and a consistent approach to, uh, to dealing with all these issues. And it's important to do that. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I, I think about all the time is, you know, what, what are the things that we need to do from, from in terms of the training evolution for, for new people coming into the workspace? But really associated with that is what are what are some of the keys to actually you know motivating the next generation of aviation professionals to, to come into this great industry we have? This is a great question, and I never thought I would be uh, on social media to the extent that I've been. For some of that was <laughs> too. by the pandemic. Um, but what it's done is, you know, in the old days, and, and we have to catch ourselves doing this sometimes, but it was like we would put something on our website or, you know, put a uh, glossy brochure out, hey, we're the FAA or, or we're an airline or, you know, come work for us or come. And it really kind of uh, didn't necessarily engage a broad, broad segment of the population because a lot of times, like my dad was an Air Force pilot. So if you didn't have somebody in your family or somebody that you knew that had been in aviation, it, it can seem like kind of a closed community. And I think that, that uh, that's changed a lot uh, over the last probably 20 years or so. But I think particularly today, 
when we're talking about some of those new entrants uh, like drones, like commercial space, uh, like uh, data scientists, you know, data analytics, there are a lot of pathways um, into the aviation aerospace sector that didn't exist um, years ago. So what we, what we really need to do is meet people where they are. And, you know, whether it's their families or, uh, uh, and just show them, you know, what the opportunities are. Uh, we're doing a partnership with the National Air and Space Museum, where we have students come in and we've got FAA folks who are, who are over there supporting some of their programs that they have planned for the next few years. And so there's, and our, our regional offices have what we call our STEM AFSED program, which is uh, outreach to local communities, because we've got to get them. Uh, while they're young and while they haven't decided necessarily what their what their career is going to be. So I think it's the um, we sort of have to turn the telescope around and meet meet uh, young people where they are and show them the opportunities um, in aviation and aerospace, because I do think that there are tremendous opportunities like there never really have been before. Yeah. I was talking with a colleague of mine recently, and we were, we were talking about getting them excited about the industry in high school is almost too late. We got to be it thinking is. about it in yeah. the lower grades. And well, that's where I got excited about aviation was, was when I was six, seven, eight years old. And, and so while it's important to get some of those STEM programs and such going, we really got to find ways to even get, a, get, get the attraction at a, at a younger age, I think. No, I, I remember, I mean, a good example, um, I had a chance to go down to uh, uh, Kennedy Space Center and see the uh, the Mars launch, the Mars um, mm -hmm. Perseverance and Ingenuity, and I was really yeah. excited to see Ingenuity fly. I can't get enough of that. Um, but was down there with a bunch of students, you know, and just to see the look in their eyes uh, as that thing, you know, launched up into space, and then uh, the first uh, NASA. Um, FAA license launch. I was able to watch that from the uh, with about 50 or so uh, middle school students uh, from the roof of NASA headquarters down at uh, KSC. And I think that was a life changing event for me to see a night launch where you could actually see the, uh, the first stage recovery. I know it's something that they'll never forget for their whole lives. And hopefully some of those young people will come into uh, aviation aerospace careers. I hope so too. So we gosh, we covered a, a lot of material. We're almost out of time here. Um, so just one last, hopefully an easy question for you. Um, knowing what you know now, would you have done anything differently in your career or would you have even pursued an aviation career in the first place? Oh, I, I'm, I can't, I mean, I, Terry, I can't think of anything. I, I, I'm having a blast doing what I'm doing. Uh, love solving problems, love working with people, um, love having this, you know, this discussion with, with leaders like you and organizations like RTCA. Um, and I've been very fortunate that, uh, you know, I had a, a great career in the military and was able to go into a commercial aviation and then blessed with the opportunity to come here to the AC. It wasn't something that I aspired to, you know, as I tell my kids, um, the best, best thing you can do is do the best that you, that bloom where you're planted, you know, do, do the best of the job that you have and, mm -hmm. uh, and then be ready for the opportunities when they present themselves. I think sometimes when you're younger, you're thinking about the next thing, kind of wishing your life away a little bit. You really need to concentrate on do, being the best teammate that you can. And there's a lot of different ways to lead, no matter where you are in an organization or what your role is. And if, and then uh, that's, that's how you make yourself ready for that next opportunity. Exactly. Administrator Dixon, thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership. Um, thank you for being with us today and for taking time. I know you're very busy. And so taking that time is, is very, I'm very appreciative of that. I know the audience is as well and appreciate some of the insights you had with us. So again, thank you. Thanks, Terry. Pleasure to be with you and an honor. Great. So I've been speaking with the Honorable Steve Dixon, the FAA Administrator, and I know we all appreciate his valuable participation in the discussion this afternoon. Uh, to the audience, thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope you found today's presentation uh, both educational 
inspiring, uh, and even evolving. And again, these webinars are being recorded. So if you want to review anything presented today or any of our past webinars, you can do so by going to the RTCA YouTube channel. Uh, in my introductory remarks, I mentioned that RTCA conducts numerous training courses throughout the year. And, and one of our newer courses that's coming up next month is one on safety management systems. Uh, we teamed up with the MITRE Corporation to deliver the training to line management and to other individuals who, who play a key, who may be playing key roles in safety management systems, but they may not need the level of detailed knowledge required by safety profession, professionals. Um, this is also valuable for personnel from the new entrance to the aviation system that we talked about today that, that may be unfamiliar with its concepts, some of its components, and the importance of creating a positive safety culture. So again, you can uh, sign up for that course at the RTCA website, www.rtca.org. I hope you'll all be able to join us uh, for our next online webinar, which, which is going to be held again next win, or, I'm sorry, Wednesday, February 16th. Again, that'll be at one o'clock Eastern time. And joining me next month will be Mr. Robert Poole, the Director of Transportation Policy. And he's a Cyril Freedom Trust Transportation Fellow at the Reason Foundation, which is a public policy think tank based uh, in Washington, uh, DC and in Los Angeles. Uh, the United States has long led the world in air traffic control technology. But in recent years, a number of technological innovations have been pioneered and, and put into regular loot but regular use by uh, air navigation service providers and companies before reaching airspace users here in this country. So in this webinar, Mr. Poole is going to review several such cases, and he's going to suggest several hypotheses that might explain the why behind the U.S. lagging in advanced technology implementation. So it should be quite an interesting presentation and discussion. So I, again, I hope you can, can join us next month for that uh, webinar. Again, thank you all for being with us. I hope you all have uh, a wonderful day and look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you.